Um, okay, um, so I, I'm actually a sculptor based at Project Workshops in Quarley, which is very near Andover. Now, I don't just work in clay for bronze and bronze resin. I also um, do a lot of welded steel sculptures. Um, so I just want to show you just a couple of examples of my other work I've made. These were three Pegasus sculptures, sculpt, sculptures I um, made at the end of 2012, and they now leap out to the streets of Nottingham, very appropriately, a place called Flying Horse Walk. Um, so I wanted to get a photo of them all together before I installed them. Um, so we've got some nice shots, and, and now they're all two opposite one entrance and one the other side um, jumping out onto the opposite street. Um, so that was a, a lovely commission to have. And being mythical horses, I thought the quality of having translucent and reflective stainless steel mesh kind of gives them a magical quality. So they're translucent in the day, and they really leap out at night when they're lit up by the sun or lights. They're, they're quite interesting. Here is uh, one of my bronze Labrador portraits. This is it polished up in bronze, ready for the patination stage. This was a lovely um, dog called Echo. I completed her for a client a couple of months ago, and this is her being coloured. It was a heated torch. The, um, the patina, the, the particular uh, metal oxide, is burned into the bronze before it's fixed with wax. And here is me welding a leopard. The, I, I made a pair for a client, um, which now, one sitting in a, a lovely tree, the other is sort of reaching up towards him. So I, was, I, I love welding, as you can tell. I like large-scale sculpture, too. Here is um, has a wonderful commission. Um, this is actually a plaster cast, which I've kept. But the bronze um, was commissioned for the British Racing Drivers Club. And it was a lovely chap called Professor Sid Watkins who changed safety in Formula One motor racing. And he sadly died a couple of Septembers ago. And they kindly um, gave me the honour of sculpting him. And he was an eminent brain surgeon who became friends with Bernie Eccleston. And he was the first um, at the scene if any of the drivers came off and had a crash. So I thought having him in his trademark overalls, his, he had a ready grin, he had a great sense of humour... Trademark glasses, I thought these are all things that the drivers associate with him, and, and they were pleased with him. An angel, just a year ago, was installed at Winchester University, and a lovely commission. She's eight foot, and she welcomes people to King Alfred's campus in Winchester. So I was already beginning to make... Um, some of these pieces show I was beginning to make bigger scale works that go outside and... Um, you know, public setting, and this is the sort of work, since I graduated in 1997, I've always strived to, you know, be involved with such lovely projects as these. Here is uh, just one of my three-metre canvases of a racehorse, and the client wanted it inverted into a black background, so that's now um, just been delivered to a restaurant called The Jockey. Okay, another portrait. I'll, I'm going to move on to the War Horse project now, don't worry. Um, it's just <laughs> one of my spaniel portraits there. Now, okay, now, now we get on to the war horse. Now, for the last several years, I've very much um, been inspired by um, you know, Alfred Munnings and Jack Seeley, Warrior, that story. I'd always thought I'd love to get the opportunity to sculpt them one day. Um, I've got the, you know, not, not bad really being involved with the Romsey War Horse project. But I love Munning's paintings. They have such vibrancy, and he painted from life there. So when I first found out about this project, which was back in 2011, and actually doing this talk here is very appropriate because this is where I first um, got my resource material. I met Anne James and Sarah Hargreaves, and I, I found out for the arts officer for Tess Valley. He, he knew that I... Um, made equestrian work, and he, he said that there was the possibility of a war horse piece being commissioned in Romsey at the time. Um, the budget and exactly what was required wasn't known, but I was so keen to be involved in such a, <coughs> a, a project. So I came and started doing my research then. 
um, nearly three years ago. So I always was thinking of, of, I was originally thinking Officer and his horse. Here is one of his, he didn't sculpt so much, but you can see the anatomy of the horse, he knows it so well. I mean, it's a, that's a beautiful sculpture, even in silhouette you can see he knows horses inside out. This is, this is one of the charging scenes. I actually think it was Boa War, actually. Here are some images of um, horses being, I think, coming off the trains before being walked to Romsey. And I believe every day they used to be walked through the streets, Romsey High Street. So um, I remember um, one of the fundraisers I've, I've, I've been to, one lady was telling me that her grandmother used to sit on the cliff tops. Um, at Swathing and see the horses get loaded up onto the boats every day. Um, and Phoebe was at Phoebe Merrick, who's um, a local historian, was telling me that in the first 12 days after Britain became involved in the Great War, 140,000 horses were apparently rounded up in those 12 days. Incredible. And um, as probably a lot of you know, 120,000 horses actually went through and were trained and went to France um, from the Romsey Remount Depot. Um, this was one of my early sketches. My very first, funny enough, is actually this one here. And some of you may be familiar with my Romsey Warhorse sketch, um, but Paul didn't actually have that on file, so I will forgive him. Um, a similar concept. What I saw was when I was doing my research, I saw a lovely Lana Edwards sketch um, called Pals, and it showed a trooper and his horse, and it was a close-up of their heads, but it just showed a companionable affection between them. And so I was sort of, at the time I wasn't sure whether it would be a freestanding sculpture, whether it might be a wolf frieze, or whether it, it might be a mural or a bench. So I was actually sketching out lots of different ideas at the time. Funny enough, I would come back to that original concept of the trooper with his horse. Here's me, some of my, uh, doing some sketches um, and lots of resource material. I always sort of, um, when preparing for sculpture, you want to be doing lots of drawing. You want to have a lot of images around you. Having the backstories from people that were there, having um, old reference photographs, obviously, from 100 years ago, essential. I just um, just surrounded myself with it, um, and it was actually last March um, when the new arts officer for Test Valley, um, Alex, actually approached me and said, "Amy, do you know about this Warhorse project?" And I said, "Funnily enough, I do." And she actually asked for formal applications from sculptors. So I, I'm not sure how many other sculptors there were. But I was given the amazing news last March that I, was set, I got the job. So I, that was a very special day. Of course, all the hard work <laughs> was to come, but still, that was incredible. So I'm doing my research now. This um, is actually, this model was essential for once the piece had been approved by the committee. And over the last 18 months, I've got to know committee members very well. And when I first started working with the clay, I was sending images showing the progress of it. And um, I had their feedback. And it was approved at, a, at a, a meeting in Romsey. And they said, yes, go ahead. These white marks you can see on the resin help scale up accurately into three dimensions to make a life-size piece. You can see this grid at the bottom. It's essential to have a central grid. And you can go up. You work out a scale, so I divided, you know, I worked out, so it's a 16-1 horse, I can't remember how many centimetres that is, but I worked out the height of the horse and divided it by the height of my maquette, and then I had my ratio so that I could accurately work out, make sure every dimension was accurate to make it in 3D. And you'd lose plumb lines and measuring tools from a stand, so you can go in there and get the accurate measurements from three dimensions. So you basically... I, we haven't got an image, but on a base, lots of hundreds of measurements are worked out on a plan, so you can work out high, where different points are of the horse, and it's made out of scaffolding poles, welded steel, two layers of mesh, because this has to be able to um, carry the weight of a ton or more of clay. So you need to have a structure that is incredibly safe. 
another angle. These spots show the lines actually of the scaffolding poles going through the centre of the life-size clay horse and vertical ones, there are two there. And if, when you see later photographs of my life-size clay, you see the two main poles going up into the horse and you can see that. So um, they, we were able to accurately get the measurements for the big piece. Here is one of my limited edition bronzes. I've got one here being patinated. It's having ferric, a type of metal oxide, burned into it. So over a couple of hours, you can actually put the patina or the colour onto a bronze before the colour is fixed with a wax. And depending on the shade you want, you either apply the wax hot or cold onto a hot sculpture or when it's cooled down. OK, we're jumping a little bit. Part of the um, fundraising, or just actually through being involved with this project, I was very, it was lovely to be invited to have my work at a really wonderful Warhorse exhibition in Lymington, which is actually funny enough where I met Paul and he, he said, you know, he'd like to be involved in recording the project. And at the opening of this um, wonderful exhibition, The Warhorse Story, Michael Mopago was there. And unbelievably, then they brought in Joey the Warhorse puppet. So <laughs> um, that was a very special day. And um, he came and saw my sculpture and became familiar, aware of the project. And there are just some stunning paintings there. Lucy Camp Welsh, and I didn't realise how huge her original paintings are. I've got one of her books here, but incredible war artist. And she actually focused on sort of the heavier horses and perhaps the subject matter that you wouldn't normally gravitate to. <coughs> also, she showed the women who were training um, the horses at the remount depots and women riding astride, and that was all quite new too. Um, and, and you can see one of her paintings behind. But Michael was talking to the pupils, the school children who'd been involved in projects related to the Warhol story, and he was very entertaining and a very nice man. Here we are. This little close up. Jerry came and saw my bronze and gave it a sniff and I said hello. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a very special day. And uh, Sarah came and joined me then. <laughs> and there we are, another one. <laughs> slightly flushed as I probably am today. <laughs> okay, um, here is the armature, and you can see it's pretty, pretty strong. And you've got the steel through here, you've got the keys on the hand of the trooper. Um, if it was just a straight piece of steel on its own, then clay could easily fall off it, whereas if you sort of go round with armature wire, um, on the legs of the horse, we actually welded um, screws down the legs, staggered, so the clay can key to the structure as you're applying it. Um, if it is just literally straight steel, it can just slip off. Um, and we sort of measured it so that um, there would be t roughly two inches of clay that could go all over the piece. And there it is. Yeah, you can kind of see the shape of the horse. It's a little bit rough and ready. Um, so here I am. This was probably the end of March. And I'm ready to get on with the clay work, which is obviously the opportunity to make a life-size horse in clay. Wow. It's brilliant. So what we did was um, I got bags of clay, lots of them ready to go, cheese wire, two-inch thick slabs, pre-cut them, lots and lots of them, because you want to put, you want to cover the whole piece quite quickly, very physical. I actually injured my fingers doing it because it's quite heavy work. Yeah, here's a nice arty silhouette of it. And you know, that oh, the head is not designed to follow the anatomy of the horse. It's just to provide a nice solid structure for you to put the clay on. And here I am beginning to pop the clay on. And the the neck of the trooper, it's rod that I can move because it's all he's a bit stiff and upright. And so I, I was still, I was in a position when I started working on the life size piece, I could actually make little adjustments. What I found with my maquette is the horse's hind leg that's taking the weight was too far that way. On this life size piece, I moved it more under him, which is more correct to how horses stand. So I wanted to get the cross between 
it being anatomically correct, but at the same time I wanted it to flow as a sculpture. So I didn't obsessively do a, um, an exact portrait of a horse. I had a few models. You'll see some pictures of them when you walk around. But I also wanted it to be an intuitive piece of work. I have been lucky enough to have been around horses all my life. And so working in life size felt natural to me. It's almost like you're grooming them. So you, you know where the muscles are. It was lovely. When I actually started putting the clay on, I didn't measure from my maquette. I just kind of found I was instinctively making it. And as I was making it also, I didn't want it all to be polished and super smooth. I wanted to have texture and life. I wanted it to um, have areas that are very highly worked and areas that are looser. Because sometimes when you have a finished bronze or bronze resin, um, you've got a dark patina on. Sometimes if it's very smooth, it can sometimes flatten the sculpture. But it's all about individual preference because... What's, you know, what somebody loves, somebody else won't. It's, it's, it's personal taste, and I think that's just the way I work, and I'm not saying that's the right way. It's just the way I work. This was probably after 10 days. So um, and I don't know if you can see here. On the base, we, we made it so that I could pull the trooper away from the horse because it was really important I could work on both pieces separately and um, be able to work on them uh, in the round because if I just had that there this side of the soldier would be very unresolved and it would be too awkward for me to get round and do that side accurately um, and as you can see he is wrapped in plastic um, at the early days the clay is very wet and um, you're not worried so much about wrapping it up obsessively. But as I worked on it over three to four months, um, and more of it was covered, I had to individually wrap all the legs, the tail, the head, the body of the horse, the bases, the soldier. So actually wrapping and unwrapping would take an hour and a half in itself um, towards the end. So what I would do is I would actually only unwrap the bit I was working on at the time. Here are just... That's one of the shots Paul took. And what I found, I had these great tools, these big sort of almost like a cricket bat and, and wooden batons and things. Um, and I could sort of sculpt planes. And I found I sort of was moving around the whole piece, working on it together. Um, very much wanted the rhythms of, of the muscle um, to get the flow um, of, of the horse. And with that, I could exert pressure Sometimes when I first put the first layer of clay on, I could hit it into place. And sometimes those marks followed the musculature on the horse too. Here we are probably... Yes, the head's too narrow here. This is probably a month or so in... Just a couple of different angles. Yes, I can see here, my gosh, the eyes are way too narrow there. Um, I was, it was very nice because um, a few months or two and a half months ago Meridian TV came and just um, filmed um, me working on it and I, I saw it the other day and I, the head was too narrow and oh, it's such a shame but it's all a process and, and what I find is you, you work on it intensively and then I would go away for a few days and do another, work on another commission and come back to it and then you can see it with fresh eyes. And then you think, oh, gosh, that's, that's wrong. Um, and I go away and I would check um, measurements. So luckily, I, there was a yard, a livery yard near to me, so I could go and check horses. And I could see, yes, the eyes. I need to really broaden the horse's head. Um, yes, this was just a shot from above. And I could kind of just... I wanted the horse to sort of just be... They, they sort of reflect... They're both resting their legs. The horse is just curving towards the soldier quite naturally. My initial sketch showed, similarly to the Lionel Edwards drawing, showed the trooper with his hands on the horse's nose, or head. And when I was sort of made this, I actually thought it was nice, a circular composition here, nice for you to see the elegant silhouette of the horse's head on its own. And I also decided there are lots of ovals and circles, so therefore I thought an oval base 
would be more in keeping as well. Uh, and just being able to see a sculpture from lots of different angles can also help inform you of what needs to be changed or moved. Yeah. The trooper is much more resolved here. Horse's head way too narrow. Um, but what, what I found with, with my scale model, the trooper's quite smiley. He's obviously very affectionate towards his horse. Um, a maquette is basically a working model. And you know, I was pleased with the harmony between them. But you want to develop it in the life-size piece because something that's a, a millimetre or an inch in on small scale is going to look very different life size and as I was making it I thought A, I thought it would be more poignant if the trooper was younger so I found a fantastic 17 year old model who works for an organisation called the Khaki Chums and they actually are oh, historians that live as soldiers 98% of the time so it was downtime soldiers were just having to exist in the trenches there was only 2% of fighting um, so I I, I, I was very lucky through the course of this project. I've had organisations and groups of people that have helped me get the right tack. I was loaned an um, appropriate saddle and bridle. I was loaned a tunic, the hat, and, and the troopers' um, um, breeches. Um, and um, this, this lad, um, Alex, came, and he was, we had the putties put on correctly and the boots, mm -hmm. so I could make sure that I got the uniform correct. Because obviously I want to respect historical detail without also losing artistic integrity. So I wanted to get the combination of the two. Um, and I thought it would be more affecting if he had a, a solemnness to him. He's carrying the weight of the world on his young, sol or young soldier, sh sorry, shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to suggest that they've survived warfare together his broken arm, which is yet to be put into a sling. When I made the pieces, I made the horse without the tack first. And this, with him, I made him nude before I clothed him because I wanted it to sit correctly on him. So I, I m made the arm and then I put the sling over the top of that. So he, he's got the affection towards the horse. But his eyes, I wanted to show that sadness of what he's seen. This was one of the first images I took of Alex, but at the time they only had infantry trousers. So these are not the breeches of the time. So I got them, and the hat was not quite, it was I think 20 years later or something. So he came back again to my studio, and I, we got it absolutely spot on. And we had the bandolier around him but obviously with a broken arm that would have been taken off to put the field sling on that's just uh, one of a close up um, of his head there I always think with sculpture it's you know even better when you hope, hopefully when you see it in life because sometimes you know cameras change things but um, that's quite nice it just shows some of the hopefully some of the texture there areas that are highly modelled and some also you can you can see some of my mark making. Here, <laughs> um, that's the ho this is ooh, this is probably seven, eight weeks in, and I badly in Photoshop just put <laughs> ears on him because when I first started sculpting the horse, there were no ears and he looked so angry, <laughs> so I just wanted to <laughs> soften him. But actually, those ears need to be higher up, and I actually built up the back of the horse's skull and the top of the neck. I actually added a lot more after this. Um, this was uh, in May. Um, I had an exhibition. I was really lucky to be able to work in this amazing grain store. Now it's full of grain. I got it out, out of there just in time. Um, it's being moulded to the side of the grain store now, right now, as we speak. Um, so this is May, so working into more detail now. Um, and we actually had, uh, where I'm based, um, I've got a studio with other creative businesses. There are 15 businesses. And twice a year we have exhibitions. And this was one in May, and the owner decided it'd be lovely to have an exhibition in this space. So it was all cleaned up. When I first started the sculpture, it was full of hay and full of farm machinery. 
and we, we cleared it out and it made a lovely exhibition space. So people came to come and see me work on that. Here it is. This was a couple of weeks ago. Literally the day straight after this was taken, I had to get it out of the grain store because literally a tractor was coming with a lorry load of hay. <laughs> so I was racing against the clock just to get some more photos. And you can see here, here are the main scaffolding poles going up the horse. There were two along here. Um, and it really is belts and braces, good, strong internal structure. That piece is coming up to support the trooper. That can come away for me to work on them separately. And I've taken, what I did was for photos, I, not included in this batch, I don't think. What I did was I put on the real period reins and the picket rope and put clay slip over them so it looked like model clay. Took the photos. But for when you mould something like this, you can't mould the loose bits like the reins and the bits and the rope. That I, we will, I will, with um, the, t the casting studio, we will hand make the reins and the bits and the loose bit of picket rope afterwards mm -hmm. with reinforced steel and the final material. So I've taken those off here. Makes moulding a lot easier. This is <laughs> me doing a blue steel look or something. <laughs> I think I was very tired, but anyway, there we are. That's um, just to show the scale there. Um, and because um, when I wrap the sculpture up at night, um, I tended to leave the same side and there was sun coming through. So photosynthesis was happening and you could see sort of a bit of green mould <laughs> appearing on, on this side. Um, here you can see some of my, I sort of hand modelled the saddle and um, the bridle and the girth. And I wanted to get that balance between things being <laughs> the right size but also being sculpted. It's a sculpture. It's not just a mould of a saddle and bridle. I wanted it to have life. I want to suggest the horse is a bit lean. Um, I, I just... And with clay, you can get some really nice textures. And so I made... I, I um, had aluminium um, armature wire. So if, if I didn't have that, the stirrups wouldn't hold their shape. So going through, because you've got the loop of the stirrup leathers here, I've got steel going through, so the clay can kind of key to it. And I also wanted to suggest the folded blankets. Um, another thing I was fortunate enough, um, I went to the, with Patrick Gordon Lee, we went to the Household Cavalry for a day, and they got one of their horses, um, Warrior, not wasn't Warrior, Warlord, dressed up in the gear. So apart, as well as my models that I, I got photographs of, they got me the correct period blanket and folded it up for me. So I wanted to make sure those details were hopefully um, pretty close. Um, here, um, some of you probably came to the exhibition. Ranville's Farm, which is on Pauntsfoot Hill. Actually, um, well, shame I haven't got the photos here today. Um, but there's a photo showing some of the remount soldiers in front of some stables from 100 years ago. And it's this building. And across the other side of the courtyard, I had an exhibition there last month. Um, and it was a really beautiful um, weekend and well attended. And, um, you know, some of you, I think, came. were able to see. Um, we created this life-size mobile. Here is one panel here. So Nick Hatchley, who's got a local graphics business. Um, and this is actually my clay from... Not quite finished here but it's enough for you to kind of begin to see the scale of it. Um, and there are actually four panels, but we've got one in here for you to see the scale there. Uh, here we are. There it is in there. Love, beautiful old barn. And uh, this was uh, one of my model's chips, and he was looking a lot leaner when I first got my measurements because he was super fit over the winter. Um, it was lovely. Paul's actually filmed um, him meeting the clay. And he's very relaxed here, but in the first couple of minutes, we were sort of snorting and up in the air and thought, what's that? But um, it's quite a nice sort of reflective image here. And uh, it's nice to get them together. And, and I did actually work more on this. There were some things wrong with the fetlocks and the legs, and I, I, I still 
did further adjustments after these photos were taken. And here's another one. <laughs> Lovely, isn't he beautiful? And we, all, we thought it would go one of two ways, because he's either calm as anything, but when he flips, he flips. And we got to the point after 15 minutes, he nudged and missed my clay by that much, and we thought, time to go. Or if it had been a couple of centimetres left, I'd be doing a lot of reparation work. Um, this is one of Paul's photos, and he is actually the same size, but he's slightly in the foreground, and it makes him look monumental and magnificent. But it was just lovely to have that day where he came along. And he's got the, the saddle that's loaned to me there. And another one there. Yeah, lovely boy. And as you noticed, I've modelled the horse without mane. Um, forelock and a cropped tail. I slightly tapered the tail so it aesthetically looks a bit nicer, but I just, it wouldn't have been correct for me to have flowing mane and tail for this piece. Now, right now, um, the horse and trooper, the moulding is happening. And um, here, um, the other side was moulded on Monday. The first layer is polyurethane uh, rubber which is accurately will get the detail from my clay so there'll be a negative impression of my horse and soldier. And around the edge, you've got these keys, which sort of male and female, um, um, so two halves can key in together. You get no warpage in the mould, so it, you're going to get a really accurate impression of my clay. Um, so you can see where... This is actually the polyurethane rubber there, where the clay wall has been taken away. Because what you have to do, and I'll show you a photo in a minute, I think, which has got my trooper with a clay wall around it. So this is basically <coughs> moulded in two main sections. The horse and the soldier is being moulded, the two main halves. And you get the individual um, undercuts too. Those awkward places between the legs and the hind legs. You have to have two more um, moulds there too. Um, but here you can actually see some of my the textures as well, and I've had to we had to remove the bit there. And this is another one showing Andrew putting in the key points, and there are so many just to make sure it's a really good join. Also along these walls on the edge, extra thick um, polyurethane rubber is put on to give it more strength around the outside. And as you can see, what I did was I, I just made the reins and the picket rope um, up to the point where they came loose from the horse. And this was uh, yesterday. So the other side has got two layers of the rubber on it. Um, this side was left with a plastic wrapped until they were ready to make the mould on this side, um, pour the rubber on this side. And just before they apply this not pretty looking stuff, um, they spray with this special wax, which actually means it will come away successfully from the clay. And the, uh, by the end of this week, both the soldier and the horse will be completely covered in these rubber jackets, reinforced with a resin jacket, which is um, solid around the outside, and they're just left for a week. And because it's a vacuum, the clay is not going to dry anymore, and the polyurethane can go off properly and be really strong. They don't want to rush taking it off if it hasn't quite set. And this is one of Paul's images. You can just see all the seam work here. And the other, the other leg is still wrapped up in. And they've literally just sprayed, you can't really see, they've just sprayed the racks on ready to put the first layer of liquid rubber on. Um, and so the other side of the horse is all wrapped up in plastic, ready for the following day. And what they did was they've also moulded this side of the base all in one go to. And here is um, the head, and it's got the first layer of this. A clear, polyurethane is a clear um, rubber. Um, and so they can actually see, um, um, you know, make sure that every nook and cranny 
has got, you know, has been covered. And what they do in the first layer, if there are any bits that are missed, they don't push it in because you can actually damage the surface of the clay. So what they do is they wait for that first layer to go hard, which is safe enough after an hour or an hour and a half, put the second layer on, and then the previous layer has actually hardened around the clay, so then they can get in with the, the rest to make sure every nook and cranny is um, moulded. And they actually, you see them blowing it into the caps. Um, and here's this morning, just before I came here, now the trooper. These are the clay walls, about so thick. And every several inches, there is um, a metal support pushed through <coughs> into the soldier to make sure it's really secure. So that's being done. It will have its first layer of um, rubber on now. I'll go back later after this talk and take more photos. And here is, this was taken a while ago, but this is roughly the position where the horse will be in the memorial park. Um, and they will be facing and honouring the existing memorial that's in the park. And by the time of the unveiling, which we're hoping will be next April, which is the centenary of the opening of the depot, um, there will be landscaping around it too. So it will be in a nice setting and... Um, Hopefully, um, well, I'm just looking forward to getting it all safely made and done and installed and um, um, a very, very exciting project to be working on. And uh, um, yes, and please, please feel free to ask me any questions. I think that's about it. So yes, please feel free to ask anything. Thank you.